Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great lunch. It's always a hard act to follow when you're you know, full and, and people get a little tired, but I promise to keep this engaging. I was thinking to myself, it's going to be really sad as a marketer to deliver the most boring presentation at an accountant conference. So <laughs> hopefully that's, that's not the case. Um, and thank you, Greg, uh, for that introduction. Um, you know, on the personal side, I do have three kids who are addicted to Xbox Live, and my wife gives me a hard time about that because they can't get off their, uh, their Xboxes to do their chores. So I'm really, really excited to be here to um, talk to you about how to level up your marketing. And um, if you're in this audience, there's two types I see here. There's either the accountants who really care about growing their business, so good for you. Hopefully I'll give you some tips that will help. Or you're part of my team and you felt somehow forced to come here today. So there, there's one right there, Kimberly Schick. All right. So um, share a little bit about myself. I have been working in the marketing industry for quite a long time actually over two decades, in fact. And no, I didn't start my career when I was 10. I'm just a very young looking uh, person, uh, or looking person. Uh, I started my career at Procter & Gamble in brand management. Uh, I studied marketing. Uh, when I went to business school, I was actually had a chance to um, uh, interact with this, uh, at the time, a little known author named Adam Grant, who has now become a, a big deal uh, at least his books, his teaching was okay. Um, and I spent the last like 16 years uh, in Seattle, that's where I live, um, and uh, working across some really uh, big and notable brands like, like Xbox, uh, Amazon Prime, uh, and uh, Amazon Web Services. Now, many of you here, you're accountants, and I will say that is a, a profession that is near and dear to me. Uh, my brother is an accountant, um, I took several accounting courses in high school where I fondly remember doing uh, ledgers and you had to do those things by hand on a, on a worksheet so you didn't even have like the benefit of spreadsheets to make sure everything balanced out. You had to do it manually. Uh, and then learning about gap principles and for some reason that has always with me, like this idea that you had these rules and these principles about how to go about uh, not only a profession, but how you do business. And I think that's something that I've really taken with me uh, throughout my career in terms of just how to do things and how to do things right. Um, and I would say, like, accounting was the very first thing that really got me into uh, a career in business because you learn about you know, uh, how things work, how things are accounted for, where the numbers are. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, honored to uh, be in front of uh, accountants and to be talking uh, to you all and hopefully dispensing um, something of value to you. Um, I've always really appreciated the fact that there are very exacting standards when it comes to uh, being in a field that is highly regulated and governed. And being uh, a career marketer, you know, marketing can seem as far from accounting as any other business discipline. You know, we're, we're, we're subjective, it's a little abstract, there's some, some artistic elements to, to marketing. Uh, but the truth is, there are a lot of components to marketing, you know, um, and the, depending on which discipline you look at, uh, I've done things from creative advertising campaigns to highly analytical, data-driven performance marketing uh, campaigns. Um, but the core of marketing comes down to some very important and fundamental basics. So what I'm going to share with you today is grounded in some of these fundamentals that I've learned and have applied across different categories from packaged goods to technology to entertainment. Um, marketing to different audiences, whether it's B2B, B2C, uh, or professions. I've, I had, I've had the opportunity to speak to uh, developers, to speak to pediatricians, uh, to speak to veterinarians as well. So um, I'll share with you how to think about marketing from the standpoint of like, what would I want to know if I was an accountant? 
And how can I, and I, as I deliver this presentation, I'm gonna do so with the precision and accuracy, or at least try to, that you all, as accountants all share. So first, it's important for me to level set by what I mean by marketing and how I'm defining it. And if you uh, said most simply, it is the process of getting your customers interested in your product or service with the intention of driving to a sale. Now, that's true whether you're talking about you know, someone who's new and they're looking and they're unaware of what you do, um, or it could be talking to someone who is already in the market for uh, a, an accounting, accountant services and they're considering between different options, uh, or if you go all the way to the end of a purchase process, you know, how do you get that person to make that leap? How do you get that person to choose you? Because ultimately, that's what you want um, at the end of the day. Um, and it's really about sustaining that level of interest from like really top to bottom um, and, 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 and making sure that people really have an understanding of what you can offer them. Now, different categories uh, rely on different strategies to position themselves to drive this level of interest. For instance, if you're selling a luxury item, you're gonna appeal to a sense of aspiration on what that experience of using that product will look or feel like. Um, if you're selling uh, to an enterprise, like you're selling IT services, it may come down to a more rational message like how much time or money uh, you would save in using that piece of software. Um, now let me walk you through my mental model of how you would market a professional service like accounting, uh, accounting, particularly in the small and medium-sized business segments. Now, I like to work um, from I like to work backwards from the end state that I'm trying to achieve. And in the context of this presentation, uh, you want to know what success looks like in the form of great marketing. So, let's spend some time unpacking what great marketing is. So great marketing is, now if you look at this comic, um, you see a lot of different things on here. It's a picture of a Rosetta Stone with a bunch of businessy buzzwords. Um, and you can see some of the side commentary uh, that sadly is a little bit on the nose to the point that it makes me uh, cringe a little bit because I've seen this from time to time in my career and only the marketers laugh because they get this. They probably used it themselves at some point. Um, but really, great marketing is not this. Um, it is not about buzzwords. It isn't jargony. It's not designed to be this like abstract, uh, unknown thing that is you know, separate, separated from the practical realities of running a business. And it certainly isn't something meant to make someone feel smart. So let's talk about what great marketing would look like in the context of your profession. So great marketing for an accounting firm starts with education. And a lot of times when I talk to folks about like marketing, it's like, okay, we message or uh, say something in a way that gets people to buy something, right? And you know, while that is kind of the end state you're working towards, you gotta think about what your customer wants and what their needs are, their attitudes, their behaviors, and you gotta meet them where they're at. And oftentimes when they're in a category or when they're going down a path of looking for um, a solution, um, they, wanna, they wanna be educated. So great marketing really starts with education. And in the case of the, the clients that you, you may have, um, they are likely not experts in accounting or bookkeeping. Um, and to many, accounting can seem a little bit scary. So your ability to provide a level of education in the form of content on your website or an email it really does go a long way in establishing your firm or yourself as credible, relatable, and as experts. And it's the building block towards 
um, winning trust, which is absolutely essential to how your business show, shows up. And you've heard trust uh, talked about in several of the presentations, and it's absolutely critical. Like, if you ask me, what is the one thing that you want to be known for uh, as an accountant? It's that you are trustworthy. Um, people don't want to be sold to. And this is not a category of services where people are necessarily looking for a deal. Uh, does, does anyone watch, uh, or did anyone watch Better Call Saul? Yeah, it's a great, great show. So there should be no Saul Goodman in the accounting firm, or you should try not to aspire to that in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, people are willing to pay for a great service, and your job should be to educate people factually and directly on what you offer them and why they should choose you. So great marketing is also about being of service. And this does go hand in hand with education, but there is a nuance to this. Whereas education is about what you offer and why someone should choose you for their accounting, this is about marketing in a way that delivers value to the customer. So how do you do that? It could be through an article you post on a local website, a Q&A, uh, or videos that you publish out there. This is really about showcasing your expertise to demonstrate to customers that you are someone who can provide that same level of expertise to your client's unique needs. And lastly, great marketing is about building relationships. Marketing should not just be about acquiring a customer um, or facilitating a one and done transaction. Getting the customer is just the start particularly in a professional service such as yours that is built around trust and referrals, building that long-term relationship, servicing your customers extremely well, leveraging marketing channels to facilitate one-to-many communications lets your customers know that you're never that far away and that you're there beyond just tax season. And as you build relationships, Retaining customers over the long term is not only profitable to you, but so much business is built on word of mouth referrals that having an ability to maintain that relationship through different means creates a flywheel for how you further market and generate new and future business. So those are some high level things to keep in mind as you orient your marketing and set, set objectives around what you're trying to deliver. Let's bring it down another level and think about how to make this real. And so what I'm gonna walk you through is kind of a four step process of like how you should frame your marketing um, in order to develop a strategy and plans that you can then activate um, to achieve your marketing objectives. And the one thing I will say as you just think about marketing in general, like there is no shortage of content, material, books on a variety of different topics. Um, and it could be quite intimidating uh, to kind of be able to filter all that information and to know even where to begin. So what I'm proposing to you is to think about these next four steps as kind of that frame. And then as you look and dive, dive deeper, on your own into these different areas, it will give you a lens in which you can help discern like what's important and what's not, and where do I wanna go deeper to develop a, a level of expertise, depending on what my needs are or where my gaps and opportunities are to develop really uh, a really well fleshed out marketing plan. So the first step is around finding your happiest customers. So understand who they are, what makes them happy, um, what makes them happy particularly about what you have to offer them. So anything you can do, whether it's about education or provide, providing value, it has to be in a, done in a way that meets them or that, that is through their lens and meets them where they are. And this is not about self-expression. So you have to ground yourself in who your ideal customer is and how you're gonna serve them really well. 
but it also means knowing who your ideal customer isn't. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a second on this idea of self-expression because this is something that I've come up uh, a lot in, 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 in advice I give people around marketing or what I've seen in, in these big corporations. And that is this idea that like marketing is a one-way communication channel where I'm going to tell you everything about who I am because I work on this, I care about this, it's near and dear to me. Um, but the reality is like a lot of the marketing that isn't great is self-expressive. So it's just like when you're at a party and, or at an event and you're talking to someone and all the talk about is themselves because they want to let you know how impressive they feel. Like that's bad marketing if you apply that in, a, in like a corporate setting, right? So it's really important to figure out how to meet customers where they're at and how to turn prospects into happy customers. And what I would say is that you are far better off with a smaller base of extremely happy customers than a large base of customers who are completely indifferent to you. So it involves understanding what makes your customers happy about what you offer them and truly doubling down on those things. Because at the end of the day, those things you offer that make them happy are often the types of things that you do really well and the things that will help differentiate you. And so once you know who these folks are, um, study them. Think hard about their qualities and characteristics. You know, what makes them tick? What are some of the things that pains them? What types of businesses are they? And what types of industries do they serve? How big are they? Like, what's unique about them? And how do they operate? And where are they located? The more you know about that, the more you can figure out how to find more customers like them and then build a basis for how you expand and scale your clientele. Now, I referenced word of mouth earlier in terms of building relationships. Word of mouth and generating what we call organic referrals is the holy grail of marketing. And it's a byproduct of great product, a great marketing with a great product or service experience. We tend to only share people, uh, sorry, share stories with people who want to hear them. So when you delight a customer, they tend to find others who have the exact same problem, like messaging homing pigeons. We all do a little bit of this in our personal lives, am I right? And I'm sure you can think about other areas where you may do this too. Now, according to the Harvard Business Review, more than 80% or 84% of a purchase cycle starts with a referral or involves one. And 90% of B2B sales involves a referral. Referrals has a priming effect. Now, customers in this digital world will often do their own research, so you can't just leave things to whether your business has word of mouth uh, at the end of the day and call it quit and, and call it quits if it doesn't. You have to build to it. It's something that you have to invest in, and you have to complete the mi missing links of driving someone who is thinking about using you to someone who ultimately will decide to use you. And that's where the education and being of service piece comes in. Now, to really harness the power of referrals, you can incentivize them, offer a free consultation, or if a client refers another client to you, give them some money back. But even if you don't, you can make it easy for your customers to send a quick email to anyone with a link for more information about your offering. So here's a pro tip. Case studies are great. They promote you, but they also promote your clients. So think about that as you're building your, your content. All right, happy customers tend to be high in something, whether it's spending, satisfaction, or engagement. They, they buy a lot, they appreciate a lot, and they'll probably talk to you a lot. Now, I'm gonna get a little tactical and prescriptive here, and it's what you see on these slides. Like, ask them for some time, run them through these questions, and together, produce an understanding of like who that ideal customer is, 
and showcase and produce materials that show how much you are a fit for that type of customer. Now, depending on your size, you can absolutely do a survey with your existing clients to learn some of this. But as an ongoing practice, include these questions in your cl client onboarding conversations. And if you have a, a, a capture form or an account creation on your website for your clients, track the different sources of traffic or how people find you to these forms and put questions like, how did you hear about us? Here's another tip. How did you hear about us answers is important, but you need to rotate the responses, especially if it's like a multiple choice, because sometimes you can get bias for, uh, in the answers, as people often choose the first choice um, in that list, so in order to speed through. You always want to take what you learn as well with a grain of salt and compare it with something else that you know. So as a, a last tip in this slide, um, don't be too specific in a drop-down list or offer too many choices. Like, I like to keep things simple or as simple as like a referral from a colleague or friend, web search, saw an ad, or other, and let people fill in that, that field. So this next slide here, don't pursue those customers so beyond the pale. There is a limit to how much they're willing to entertain your attention and be called and be upsold, like through email. And yes, I know, we're gusto. We've learned this lesson the hard way, thanks to a lot of the input from our accountant partners. So um, we're speaking from a place of like genu genuineness and authenticity in, in this area. <laughs> so if your marketing plan makes your best customers less loyal, um, say by constantly sending them emails, like re rethink that. Because there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. Uh, and getting that balance right by putting yourself out there, uh, by, not, by not saturating or annoying your customers is critical. And obviously, do not do what's in this comic strip here. So gather everything you can um, glean from those top customers. That research powers the rest of your marketing. Research doesn't have to be some like very expensive study or survey. Um, and as you may have learned from our accelerator training yesterday, here are a few things that will tell you if a client is going to be a good fit for people advisory. You know, look for those who have uh, complex workforce needs. Uh, for example, a mix of employee types, full-time, part-time, contractors remote employees or employees across different states. Clients intending to grow their workforce are also good candidates, as are those who are planning a permanent shift to remote working. For look, so, so look for some of those cues. But don't forget to rely on your gut and intuition. When I was at Amazon, there was no shortage of having access to um, valuable and insightful data. And I remember in like my very first days when I was being trained, like they told you that yes, you could have access to George Clooney's buying habits. And you had to take that responsibility very famous or very seriously. Um, now, I'm sure that many of us do also wish we spent less time on Amazon buying things online. I, I know I do. Um, but there is a saying that whenever the data and anecdotes disagree, the anecdotes are usually right, that you're just measuring or interpreting the data wrong. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at data, like pressure test it, kick the tires a little. Does this make sense? Am I confident in how I measured and collected this data? And know that like, when you can marry um, quantitative data with um, uh, qualitative sensibilities, like generally you're moving in the right direction. So as a pro tip, you know, create diary, a diary of your insights. Like use a Google Doc or some other place to capture when you've learned something new. Date it, include that data that you looked at it uh, and what your conclusions were. And over time, this becomes a cookbook for how you can grow your firm 
which you can share with new team members who are also working on new client acquisition. All right. Um, step two, like start with the things that you can measure. Marketing has come a long way since the time I started my career where you used to attribute some end outcome to like a set of different inputs that coincided with it. And you do some like loose pattern matching in hopes of like finding some level of correlation. And like that's how I did it when I was at Procter & Gamble. Sometimes you would see a volume spike in orders when you were running a flyer at Walmart, for example. But beyond that, there was this black box where you just didn't know like what caused what. Now the good news is that black box is more translucent. It's not tr totally transparent, but it's trans translucent. And by, by that, what I mean is you can see the light and you can detect signals. It's not perfect. But the truth is we do all have the ability to measure the marketing activities that we put out there. And there are a range of marketing tactics that you can, empl uh, you can employ. You could sponsor a local soccer uh, team, for example. Um, but some of the more measurable, but some things are more measurable than others. And I generally counsel people, especially when you're starting out your marketing plan, to establish programs that are measurable so that you can focus on learning. Like whether it's learning about the tactic itself, um, about what messaging pulls, and how to refine the way you target um, the customers that you're reaching through your marketing. And once you're done exhausting those things, move towards some of the less measurable things that make sense to you. But make sure that you're using that sparingly. It's important to remember, though, that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. So I'll let that quote stick in a little bit, but the truth is, like, when you, just because you don't see an effect, it doesn't mean the, uh, whatever caused it wasn't true. It's just you couldn't measure it. In marketing, what you want to do is advance a prospective customer through a series of steps. You want them to take action. We also use a term in marketing. It's not on that Rosetta, or maybe it was on that Rosetta Stone called a call to action. That one matters. Your, 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 your call to action could be to learn more as you educate your customer. It could be to drive a contact us, or it could be to complete a sale. Now, to me, one of the first things that I would do that is highly measurable is to build a list, an email list. Your first job is to get contact information from people so that you can follow up. And if you can get contact information, your life becomes easier because now you've created an entry point into that relationship with that customer. So to build that list, you need to go where your customers are, already are. They're already on email, probably on Twitter, LinkedIn even. Actually, 89% of customers use email as the primary channel for generating a lead. And then once you have that list, you want to do measurable things to grow that list and to convert that list. For example, you could run a newsletter like On the Margins. I think Caleb is right there. <laughs> All right, and to grow that list, you need forms to capture people's emails and activities that drive people to those forms. To convert people from that list, you then need to send occasional calls to actions with an offer, like a free consultation. And then to measure how that's working, you can look at your email tool or web analytics, like Google uh, Analytics, to see the total number of people you reached and how many people took you up uh, on that offer. Now, let me spend a little bit of time talking about social media, uh, because the first place that people tend to look uh, including a lot of professional services, is social media. Now, I think of social media as a broadcast channel and a good way to facilitate 
um, some level of dialogue um, and interactivity with um, your potential customers. Um, and it's a good way to get your content and the messages that you want out there and provide things of service in a very public forum. But beware of it. It's not the be all and the end all. And it comes with some important caveats. Social media companies can and do change the algorithms unexpectedly, especially in a tough market when they're seeking to become more profitable. In one well-known case, LinkedIn severely limited the reach of, a, of company posts in an effort to encourage those companies to purchase ads to promote their posts. So any company that had invested heavily in LinkedIn as a channel had built a list that, then, that they then had to pay in order to use. So some serious bait and switching going on there. Now, of course, there are some things that are difficult to measure, intangible things that you may want to invest in, um, a website, a brand. Um, but most of what you're selling or most of what your value proposition is you and who you are. These are elements that have, or then these type of programs have a more subjective subjectivity to them. And the way I do tend to measure these things is more anecdotal. Utilize your friends, families, and, and colleagues to get feedback from them. Understand what a great website has. Like study some of your competitors who you believe do it well in your space. See how they talk, research, and understand what elements that may work for them, and what may work for you, and what may not. And avoid the temptation for what we call vanity metrics, uh, like eyeballs, for instance. Does anyone even know what that means here? OK, we'll add that to the Rosetta Stone, too. Um, this is upfront work that allows you all to do the marketing that follows. And if you know what you're doing, you can still measure it. Now, most marketing should be measurable. You'll want to form a hypothesis and then test it. You might need to create a new hypothesis um, and try again whether, based on whether it succeeded or failed. And then document and record that marketing knowledge that you figured out and stop doing the things that don't work. So yes, marketing is a science. And leaning in on that, those scientific components uh, alongside some of the more artistic elements can make you very successful in your marketing approach. Now you can measure a lot of things and I've given you some examples of things that you should consider like a, how much you're paying for a lead, a cost per lead, or how much you're paying for new acquisition. Client lifetime value, like how much are they worth to you over time? And this is a very important metric because when you know what they're worth to you, then you know the limits to which you can spend to acquire them. Um, return on ad spend, like if you're spending money on Google, how much business do you need to see in return to justify or at least break even on that investment? Um, what is your win ratio? Your, how well are you retaining clients? Um, traffic conversion, when someone visits your website to when they become a lead, um, how, uh, what, what does that look like? And are you efficiently converting interest into opportunities when people come and visit your site? Um, and customer uh, effort score, like how much effort was it to acquire that customer? Like going back to some of my earlier slides, like you want to think about who your happy customers are and who you aren't. And you certainly don't want to be spending an inordinate amount of effort getting customers that don't matter uh, to what you have to offer or that are just really hard to get or hard to service. So step three, beware of fads. Like, and fads meaning like, whatever the buzzword du jour is, right? It, and it, it's something that it's very easy to fall in love with, um, especially when you're dealing with some of the more creative elements of marketing, that you can easily lose sight that marketing is really applying that art and science in pursuit 
of a commercial goal. Focus on these fundamental things. Like, don't get caught up on those latest trends. And I see this happen time and time again from friends who ask me for marketing advice. Because the one secret about the marketing profession is that it's great about marketing itself, as it should be. All right. Now, being discovered and getting in front of customers is your first job. Your next job is to make sure that you have um, their attention and that they trust you. So I'm going to pause for a minute while you read this comic strip for a moment. Uh, and I, I know you'll be done when you laugh at the end, or you don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> All right. I can't tell you how many times I've been in meetings uh, similar to this where some executive asked me about the latest social media flavor of the month that usually they hear about like their kids. Um, so it's tempting to think that you have all these channels that you can use to produce content. Um, so where should you show it? Is it on any of these sites? Is it on TikTok or should it be on TikTok? Are your customers, are, are your customers even there? And is this where trusting relationships are formed? So going back to my earlier um, great marketing principle, the real question is, what are the right channels for which you can offer value? And there is this famous saying that the medium is the message. Posting on an accountant forum on Reddit, a talk at a local chamber of com commerce where the customers that you want attend, or being on LinkedIn, and targeting that audience um, is really the way you should think about that. Because at the end of the day, it's better. Maybe it's not as fun as producing a viral video on TikTok, but you'll find a lot more success in it. And as you think about this, the real litmus test is, are you giving more value than you're getting, or from a customer standpoint? And is this so valuable that someone might pay for your services? And if, if not, like what would make that content so valuable to make your potential prospects and customers think that you have something value to offer them? And I'll tell you this, like, don't be afraid to give the expertise away. And, and my parents always taught me that, that, that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, except today, unless some of you may have paid for your tickets. But um, the reality is, like, you might think that giving away free content or writing an article like, hey, I'm giving this away for free. What am I getting for at the end of the day? Or you'd rather gate some of that material behind a paid consultation. But that is the wrong way to think about it. Um, nothing is for free, and when you give away something um, there's a principle, there's a book that I would recommend you all read called Influence by um, uh, Robert Cialdini. Um, it's a book about, it's not a marketing book per se, but it's about the different things that makes you persuasive um, and it makes someone um, uh, listen and, and, and ultimately nudge, nudges, you, nudges them to do what you want them to do at the end of the day. And one of those principles is this idea of reciprocity. So when you give something away for free, and that person finds value in what you've given for free, uh, then in, in some ways they will feel like, oh, you know, I, 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 I have an obligation in some ways to at least check it out or learn more about um, this accounting firm that has given me this great advice. So don't be afraid to give away that advice and your expertise. And, and here are some examples of what you could give away uh, for free. You could do summaries, offer a pers uh, perspective on a matter, like in a LinkedIn post, for example. Be the first to break important news on something timely that could affect um, your clients, like you know, interest rate hikes, for example. Doing step-by-step -step guides, 
checklists are, are always fun and easy to consume. Uh, or you could go deeper, do research, white papers, create useful stories to help bring to life whatever it is you're trying to communicate. Um, you can even think about entertaining ways to deliver content. Um, and going back to my first point, like ultimately thinking about the ways in which you can educate your customers. Um, because the more you share, the more they assume that you know. So step three is finding partners with skin in the game. This all could seem somewhat intimidating with all the different things that you need to do. Um, but the truth is, you don't have to do it all on your own. There, there, there's many resources on the internet to help you get started and arm you with the knowledge that you need to create a plan or to get started. But if it's not something you have the time or space to learn, there are ways that you can outsource expertise. The way I think about it is, these are the areas that you want to build programs around and how you get started. Um, and I would, but I would caution you in finding a place that does all of these things in one, because chances are they won't do one thing particularly well, or you'll pay a lot for the premium and convenience of having it all in one place. But figure out, like, within content, strategy, SEO is very important, design, advertising, creating leads. Like, where are the areas that you feel comfortable kind of taking on yourself or hiring that expertise internally within your, your firm? Um, and what are the areas where you that are truly important that you want to have an expert on your side to help you implement programs around? And it goes without saying that like, to do all of these things, you need basic marketing infrastructure. But depending on how big you are, Maximize the packages that come from your web hosting companies. If you're starting small, chances are they can provide you with kind of the um, uh, early steps to get you on your way in those areas that I described. Um, if you use a professional web grade, uh, grade web hosting company, that's a no-brainer. It won't get you on the first page of Google to just set expectations, but the input to out ratio, output ratio is off the charts. And it's a com common denominator. They've mastered it, uh, and they've packaged it. And you can leverage the scale that those web hosting companies have to get a quick jump on these areas. Now, if you pick an agency, it can be very expensive, like I mentioned. Um, and sometimes these agencies may not be well known, or it's hard to discern whether it's a good agency or not. Uh, but if you must hire an agency, uh, find a competitor who's doing really well, figure out who their agencies are or who they work with, um, and go hire their agencies or ones like that in the same class. Have these service providers explain how well, how will they measure success, um, set that up, and, dis uh, and demonstrate that they can hit the goals, and hold them accountable to the end of the day. Um, set up your homepage to convert more leads. Um, how will they do that? How will they capture leads? How, will they send, um, uh, how, how are they sent to your staff CPAs? And if someone calls or clicks on your website, how will you know about that? If your agencies or contractors can't get very specific and granular around questions like how you're going to know some of these things, like, don't hire them. Run and run far. Like, don't wait until after you've signed a contract to figure out that it won't work out. Because letting an agency go is a very difficult and costly and time-consuming thing. For example, in these, let's look at some, some use cases here. If they're going to redo your website, can they prove that it's going to increase conversions? If they'll run ads in a campaign, can they show you how much revenue they've earned for you? If they're going to run a content campaign for you, can they show you the percentage of repeat visitors? And like for SEO work, that is getting your content, content to rank high on Google 
or Bing for the 1% who use that. <laughs> Can they show you your rank increase? I used to work for Microsoft, it's okay. <laughs> um, and when you have a partner who has skin in the game, meaning they're measured on what matters to you, you've got a reliable and measurable um, marketing partner. So to recap, here are the four steps that we walk through. Understand your happiest customers. Because remember, great marketing is a product of making sure that you have a really in-depth understanding of who they are, what they care about, what their problems are, and where your solutions fit in. Doing things that you can measure. Ignoring some of the fads and the trends that you will hear. It's all noise. And then finding partners with skin in the game. Now, with that in mind, you know, I've kind of given you a framework and a mental model for how you need to think about putting together your marketing strategy. But if I was to offer you like, okay, what, do you, what should you do after this session to get started, a jump start on your marketing plan, here's what I would advise and recommend for you. you know, pick, first of all, a high margin service like People Advisory to arm you with the knowledge and content because we've done a lot of that lifting for you to get started in that area.